Let's start. Szanowni Państwo, witamy na kolejnym spotkaniu Winnovators Club. Jesteśmy zaszczyceni, że jesteście z nami po raz kolejny, już po raz dwunasty. Dzisiaj naszym wielkim gościem jest profesor Wiwek Watwa. Bardzo się cieszymy, że zgodził się wystąpić przed naszą publicznością, przed Państwem i podzielić się tym, co dobrze wie, co wie z różnych z doświadczeń. To jest jednak profesor światowej klasy i bardzo dużo, mamy nadzieję, bardzo dużo się od tego nauczy. Dziękuję również pani doktor Katarzynie, pani profesor Katarzynie Śledziewskiej, że wystąpiła z nami, że postanowiła się zamoderować ten dzisiejszy, tę dzisiejszą prezentację. I w zasadzie to wszystko, co chciałem powiedzieć, oprócz tego, że zapraszamy serdecznie również na środę. W środę będzie z nami Itaj Talman, jak mówią, najlepszy doradca wśród dyrygentów i najlepszy dyrygent wśród doradców. A teraz nie pozostaje mi już nic innego, jak zaprosić panią Katarzynę Śledziewską. Katarzyna, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So, uh, hello everybody. Hello, Professor uh, Vivek Batma. I'm speaking from you to from my home in Warsaw. It's hot and sultry, and every few hours we've got the huge storms here. Uh, let me present myself at the beginning. I'm a researcher from Warsaw University, from the Faculty of Economics, and also I'm a director of a Digital Economy Lab. It's an interdisciplinary research lab where we are focused on the digital transformation of economy and society. And um, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation for today's webinar, and uh, mainly because it's uh, I've got this great pleasure to talk to you, Professor, and uh, to talk a little bit also about you from, from the beginning. So, Professor Vivek Batka is an entrepreneur and uh, academic and a leading writer and researcher in technology, innovation and digital transformation. And he is working at cooperating with and teaching at the best universities in the world. 
He's distinguished fellow and professor at the Carnegie Mellon School of Engineering at Silicon Valley and distinguished fellow at the Labor and Work Life Program at Harvard Law School. He's, uh, uh, most, he's on this most important list uh, of the top influential minds on in uh, is the uh, author of the well-written and fascinating books like Your Happiness Was Hacked, Why Tech is Winning the Battle to Control the Brain, How to Fight Back, Dr uh, Driver in the Driveless Car, Innovating Woman, The Changing Face of Technology, and Immigrants Exodus. But what is the most important, Professor Vatma is understanding the power of data and wants to use it for fighting with the cancer and for helping people all over the world. And he got the great plans and wants to start them from India. Hello, Professor. Thank you very much for your work. And uh, the floor is yours. Good. You know, um, <laughs> we're sitting here in the pandemic. This, the fact that we can now talk like this we can have hundreds of people on at the same time and we're now communicating. I'm sitting in Silicon Valley where the weather is always perfect. So it's uh, 20 degrees, 21 degrees centigrade right now, beautiful skies. I mean, it's amazing to be here, but the fact that I can be speaking to people in Poland like this is because of what technology has made possible. You know, I'm, I'm gonna walk you through technology advances and tell you why I'm very excited about the future and, and I'm very worried about it at the same time. You know, the pandemic has challenged our existence. No one ever expected this would happen. But it was predictable because we can now engineer um, uh, you know, viruses and bacteria. I'm not saying the Chinese did it, but I'm saying that this is the future that we're headed into, that we will be able to do such things. And you know, life has become unpredictable. Before, when I used to give lectures about exponentials, I would have to explain what exponential means. Now in America, even grandma is talking about exponentials. I'm sure the same is happening in Warsaw that you have everyone talking about exponentials because we understand exponential technologies. With that, let me switch over to my presentation and share my screen and, and give you a talk on technology advances. And then I can, I guess we'll come back and do some Q&A after that. Is that okay? All right, so let me um, figure out if I can do this right. All right, I'm gonna talk about solving the grand challenges of humanity and creating an amazing future. To start with, Look at this chart over here. This is the history of technology. It took thousands of years to go from agriculture to pottery to the plow to mathematics to the peak of Rome. With the last one or 200 years, we have had advance after advance after advance. Technology is advancing exponentially. Our smartphones now have more computing power than the Cray supercomputers that America would not allow to be exported to uh, Poland only 20 years ago, right? Those, uh, our smartphones are something like 40 times more powerful than Cray supercomputers, yet everyone has them. Even uh, you go to uh, the developing world, even the poorest of the poor have, have uh, smartphones now, which are supercomputers. So this is the exponential advance of technology. And the interesting thing is that it's not just computing, it is everything that computing touches that starts advancing exponentially. The futurist Ray Kurzweil has a saying, he says that uh, as any field becomes uh, information-based, it starts advancing exponentially. So you have artificial intelligence advancing exponentially, you have ro robots advancing exponentially, you have 3D printing, virtual reality networks, digital medicine, medicine nanotechnology, synthetic biology, genomics, all of these things are advancing exponentially. And you know, the difference between reality and what we perceive is well, how things were three or four months ago when we did not understand exponentials. We did not understand that you know, if you had a virus and it started doubling every you know, few days, soon you would have millions of people who have a virus, right? This is how technology is advancing and everything that, that, that technology touches goes on this exponential path. So you have multiple technologies advancing exponentially and then they converge. When technologies converge, they disrupt entire industries. I'm gonna give you some examples of, of some of the technologies which 
are making amazing things possible. I'm, I'll walk you through, you know, three or four of these technologies. But before I do that, you know, let's look at the bigger picture. The World Economic Forum talks about the fourth industrial revolution. But you know, it's much, much more than the fourth industrial revolution because everything about our lives is about to change. About to change. We now have the ability to solve the problems of humanity. The cost of advancing technologies has dropped to the point that you can innovate as much as innovators here in Silicon Valley can, that you have the same powers, you have the same abilities as the smartest people in Silicon Valley do. There's nothing that we do here that you can't do in Poland. All right, so let me start walking you through some, some of these advances and what they make possible. This is the future we can create. We have abundance of food, all the food that you want, everything you can eat. We can 3D print our clothing and household goods. We can order a driverless car at any time. We can live in perfect health. Yes, this is becoming possible. And we can enjoy unlimited, clean and free energy, education and comfortable housing. It sounds crazy, doesn't it? I'm going to show you some examples of some of these and challenge your assumptions about all of these things. But the problem is that we can also create this dark future of massive unemployment and social unrest. We're being dependent on robots for practically everything. The robots start taking over our jobs and they start becoming our masters. Gone are the thrills of, of driving on the roads. We're not allowed to drive on the roads anymore. The driverless cars take over. Gone is the satisfaction and, and gratification of working for a living. You know, Katazina was saying earlier on that she likes going to her office and work from there. Even though there's a pandemic going on and the office is closed, she feels uh, you know, comfortable in the office. <laughs> well, that's how we are. We feel comfortable going somewhere. We have a sense of belonging and we want to be working. Even if we could have all the food and energy we wanted, we still want to be working, right? But this is very likely going to disappear. And then we're being watched every moment of our lives. Everything is recorded. I'm being recorded right now. Everything I say will be used against me sometime in the future. <laughs> this, that's what the problem is. And, and here's what's happening. That the future, two futures I described are exactly the same future. We have good and we have evil at the same time. I mean, it's happening everywhere. In the United States, you have craziness right now. I mean, it's unbelievable that you have riots happening, car, cars burning. You have pandemics in America, the most advanced country in the world. The same thing is happening in Poland. You have extreme left, extreme right. You have anger. You have you know, building inequality. You have a lot of things to worry about in Poland. It's happening all over the world. So we're moving into the future at the same time. And, you know, we, the, at the same time, we could be creating Star Trek. We're creating Mad Max. Star Trek was this amazing future. This, if you saw the movie or the, or the TV series, it was about uplifting humanity, shared, living in a world of unlimited everything. And um, then Mad Max was where you, what you're seeing happening on the streets of, uh, of America sometimes, you know, people ripping each other apart. They're the same future. And the reason why it's important for you to understand these is because you have a role in creating this future. You have the ability to help us create Star Trek versus Mad Max. And this is what I want to talk to you about. I want to give you some examples of other entrepreneurs who are creating the amazing future and challenge you to use the same technologies to do good for the world. You can not only uplift Poland and Eastern Europe and Western Europe, you can uplift the whole world. You can make a global impact by using technology wisely. Today, we're being tracked, identified, and recorded. The fact is the camera's everywhere. I mean, even in Poland, you've got cameras everywhere. Everything is being recorded. If the cameras aren't there, you have drones. I mean, I, I saw some videos of some demonstrators in, 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 in uh, Poland, and you had drones going out overhead and the government watching them, right? So you've got this craziness everywhere. Tomorrow, we're going to have to worry about car hacks, DNA hacks, virtual reality schools. Well, right now, I'm talking to you uh, via regular video. Imagine talking to me on Mars or in Tahiti or, um, you know, where you name it, and uh, us all being able to interact with each other. So schooling being done in virtual reality. This is, the, this is all becoming possible right now. And then the craziness again, man and machine merging, us becoming bionics. This is all now possible. But, you know, I look at the optimistic side of things. I look at the ability to create the Star Trek that we can create, you know, we can reach for the stars and we can get into this world in which, you know, the message of Star Trek was 
that it's not about you know wealth anymore. It's not about uh, the acquisition of money. It's about bettering humanity and the, you know ourselves and the rest of humanity. This is the future. Uh, this is why I get so excited about Star Trek because this is the future that they dreamed about in that. And mankind had fulfilled itself and now it was going and exploring the stars. This is what I want humanity to do. And we need to work together to make this happen. We need to now use technology in a sensible and a wise way to take us to this future. So let's talk about you know, what, what this means. Well, we have to make some choices. We have a choice of the darkness of Mad Max or the brightness of Star Trek now. It's the choices we make that'll um, you know, take us. I'm gonna talk about the choices after I give you some examples of what's possible. I'm gonna get back to this. So hold your breath on this. What are humanity's grand challenges? Well, billions live without reliable energy. In, in Warsaw, in Poland, and in, in, in Europe, you have energy most of the time. Well, you know, in parts of the world, they don't have energy. When children in Africa and Latin America and the developing world come home, they don't have energy, so they can't study at night. You know how hard it is right now in Poland? You have, you know, most of you have air conditioning. Well, forget about air conditioning. You don't even have energy to boil water, so therefore people die from the lack of clean water. Because what happens when you have dirty water, you can boil it and capture the condensation and get perfectly clear water. But if you have no energy, you have to drink dirty water. And 88% of the infectious diseases in the world are caused by waterborne viruses. Education, you know, billions of people are left out right, uh, from education right now. Well, we have to fix that. We have to now educate the world. You know, the preventable diseases, food, poverty, these are things which can be fixed. I'm gonna give you three examples of technologies that are being developed by entrepreneurs. And I'm gonna, I want you to think about it because these are uh, you know, uh, technologies that are happening everywhere that you can contribute with. First of all, let me talk about why I'm so optimistic because right now we also have the planet warming up. That I don't know about uh, Poland, but you can see signs of global warming everywhere, right? So the problem is that we are reliant upon fossil fuels and we could destroy the planet even before we have a chance to kill each other. Uh, with Mad Max, that uh, you know, um, global warming could destroy us. But I see that problem being fixed on its own. <laughs> you know, that, that sounds crazy, doesn't it? I see us getting us into an era of unlimited clean energy in the next decade, in the next 10 years, in the 2020s, I see energy being free. Let me walk you through this. First of all, look at this chart over here. This is a chart of the energy reserves of this planet. We get 1400 times more energy every day from the sun than the entire planet consumes in a year. 1400 times every single day. We're bathed in energy. I mean, we have energy, energy, energy everywhere. The trouble is that we have not been able to utilize this energy. We've not been able to harness this energy so far. We've been depending on that little ball over there which is called petroleum. So therefore we've been destroying the world, killing each other, uh, fighting world wars over petroleum and then burning the planting up with a dirty fossil fuel. Well, this is about to change because here's what's happening. For the last 40 or 50 years, the price of solar energy has been dropping. We have long had the ability to harness it, but it was too expensive. So what's happening right now is that the price, is, the price keeps dropping. As the price drops, the installations double. As the installations double, the price drops. Look at that, these are exponential curves. You remember that chart I showed you in the beginning? There was an exponential curve. Well, you have an exponential curve of prices dropping and you have an exponential curve of prices of installations increasing. We don't seem to understand it. You have the International Energy Agency, which I don't know is brain dead to me because they keep coming up with these forecasts for energy which have to revise every year. They don't seem to be able to see the obvious. The obvious is that the cost is dropping and the installations are doubling, which means that if you keep going this way, then what happens? You come into an era of unlimited clean and free energy. I wrote this article for the Washington Post in 2004. You can Google it and find it on the Washington Post. What I said was that if you look at the exponential advance of energy, soon by 2030, it will be free. They were less than 14 years away. This, this is uh, you know, a few years, this, I wrote this uh, five or six years ago. We're uh, less than 14 years away from being able to meet 100% of the Earth's energy needs. Because if you look at the trend, 
installations. You know, in, in California, I think roughly 16 to 20 percent of energy now comes from renewable sources. It was only you know two percent not too long ago. It was only one percent a few years before that. So what happens is that when the installations keep doubling and the cost keeps dropping, it be it becomes almost free. It's not going to be free literally. You know, to me, um, uh, communications is free. This call that I'm making right now, we're we're now communicating in high definition video, and you're watching this for free. Five or ten years ago, for me to call Poland would have cost me two dollars a minute, two dollars U.S. per minute it would have cost. And forget about video phones like this. This would have you know, cost thousands of dollars to do a call like this. Now it's free, right? So if you look at the trend, the cost of solar energy will be free, free in the same way that it'll be so cheap that we won't even think about it. So when I wrote this article, it created major controversy. This, the, the fossil fuel industry went crazy. They said, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about because you still need us. Because I said that the fossil fuel industry, the utility industry will go bankrupt. They said, you still need to store energy. Yeah, you need to store energy because at, the sun doesn't shine when it's not sunny. The wind doesn't blow when it's all not windy. So, but here's what's happening with storage. The cost of storage is also falling exponentially. It's falling at the same pace as solar. So by 2028, 2030, the cost of storing energy will be almost free also. Whether we're in Poland or whether we're in Silicon Valley, whether we're in New Delhi, whether we're in Santiago, Chile, it will be so cheap to install solar panels and batteries that we won't even think of, of buying it from the utilities. We will be in, independent of the, uh, of the utility industry. This is almost certain. If you go back and read that article I just showed you, you'll see that all of the predictions I made have happened faster than I said. Things are moving faster than I said, not slower. So in the next six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years, it will be so cheap to have electric you know, uh, cars. The cost of uh, electric cars will drop to one third of what they are right now or less, even 20% of what they are. You'll be 3D painting cars, snapping batteries and motors into them for the equivalent of five or $10,000, you'll have a self-driving electric car. And these will take over our roads. This is why I'm so optimistic about that. This is in the 2020s I'm talking about. So a hint to the entrepreneurs out there, when you're looking for opportunities, start looking at exponential curves. Don't look linearly. Don't look at flat lines and you know, slow curves. Look at exponential curves. Look at what happened with the virus. Look at the way it's spreading all over the world. Use the same thought that's saying, okay, if Vivek is right and the cost of batteries drops you know, 10 or 20%, every one or two years, it's actually dropping 10 to 20% every year right now, right? But let's say it's every two years. Then the cost of electric cars will be about half of what they are right now within three or four years. And there'll be one eighth of what they are in the next whatever, you know, 10 years or so. Which means that I can now start building new technologies for electric cars. I can start building new solar technologies. If you start now looking at exponential curves and, and predicting ahead, you suddenly become the next Steve Jobs, the next Bill Gates, the next you know, uh, billionaires, the next Elon Musks, because you are now thinking exponentially and you're able to look ahead of the curve. You're able to see things other people can't see. So that's a big hint for you on how do you build successful businesses now is that you look at what's gonna happen exponentially. So you know, take virtual reality. Today, virtual reality is big, cumbersome. If you've ever tried a virtual reality headset, they're really big and ugly and they're expensive. They cost you know, between $500 and $1,000 to get a virtual reality headset. But virtual reality is advancing exponentially. I had a list of things I had. Virtual reality is advancing exponentially. To so move forward three or four or five years, you'll see that virtual reality headsets will cost $50, $100. And when you put a headset on, it'll be small, it'll be thin, because what happens is products become smaller, faster, and cheaper. So they'll become very, it'll be like eyeglasses you wear that take you into three dimensional worlds. So what does that tell you now? That means that tells you that, hey, if I start now building virtual reality tools, even though they're not affordable right now, almost no one in Poland has a virtual reality headset right now. Maybe there are a few thousand people who have virtual reality headsets. But if you start thinking that three years from now, hundreds of thousands of people have them, five years from now, millions of people will have them, suddenly you begin to see that I have an opportunity to develop new virtual reality technologies or new solar technologies. That's the beauty of exponential thinking. And this is something you can do right now.
Let me give you another example. Water. You know, 88% of the world's infectious diseases are caused by waterborne viruses. If you were an, an alien, if you were an extraterrestrial looking at this planet, listening to our, uh, you know, uh, our discussions about water shortages, you would think these human beings are crazy because it's a water planet. 71% of the Earth's surface is water. So how can we have water shortages when you have water everywhere? The problem is that it's the cost of, of cleaning the water up, which has been prohibited because of the cost of energy. So I have a, a company that I'm mentoring in Chile, Santiago, Chile, where Alfredo Zalesi, one of the most amazing people, I consider him to be an Einstein. He's that brilliant. He's got very bad business sense. He's not a good businessman, but that's a problem that entrepreneurs have. And that's why you need mentorship you know, from, from groups such as, uh, such as this, because they can guide you on how to build successful businesses. But Alfredo Zalesi came up with a solution that could transform water sanitation all over the world. I'm going to show it to you. Because, you know, for the last 60 years or so, there's, you know, 50 years, there's hardly been any new technology. You know, so, but he built a technology that simply takes water into plasma and back into water. Watch this video. The system works by compressing contaminated water and then feeding it into a chamber where a quick change in pressure and exposure to an electrical field converts it into a plasma, a state of matter similar to gas. In a plasma state, the water is ionized, killing 100% of the bacteria and microbes it carried. According to Alfredo Zalesi, a scientist at the center, the system can purify 35 liters of water in just five minutes, using the same amount of energy that it takes to run a light bulb. So uh, this is a 12 person team in, um, in Santiago, uh, Chile, which built a technology that could, that could transform water sanitation all over the world, right? And he didn't have more money than you have over there in Poland. I mean, uh, you know, Chile is a poorer country than Poland is, yet he was able to build a world changing technology. Now let's talk about, um, so he's now developed all sorts of new technologies you now have, you know, I mean, things have slowed down for the last six months because of the pandemic, but you now have Airbus and Siemens developing all sorts of new technologies alongside him. And this technology could be transformative for the world. Again, a small team in Chile did this. Now let's talk about healthcare, which is important to all of us. You know, billions of people lack, have, lack access, to, access to quality diagnostics. People get sick because they don't know what they have, even with, with the coronavirus, okay? Every, the reason why we keep talking about testing, testing, testing is because if you know what the disease is, you can deal with it. You can come up with preventative measures. You can come up with treatments and cures and so on. But the trouble is that diagnostics are so expensive. So billions of people, you know, can't afford it. Tens of millions of people die needlessly every year because they can't afford it. You know, the solution for this isn't going to come from the Western world, from Western Europe or from America, because we're spoiled here. Here in America, you can just go to the hospital and you get all the best care that you want. Even the poorest of the poor can go to a hospital and get coverage if they want. They can get diagnosed if they need to be. In the developing world, it doesn't happen because you don't have hospitals. So this is a new Delhi company. You know, again, less than 10 people who built a technology that could transform the world. Watch you know, what this is about. See that device over there? It's like an Apple TV. It does the same test that hospitals do. It does everything from blood temperature, pulse oximetry, to HIV, dengue, malaria, vitamin D, blood sugar. What is it? It's a collection of, it's a platform for integrating sensors. And this device costs about uh, you know, a thousand, a thousand and a half dollars. And each test costs a few cents. So the beauty of this is that now they've added, um, they're adding to this, the antibody testing for, uh, for uh, COVID and they're adding to it all sorts of other tests. I'm working with this company very closely right now to take it all over the world because we've added uh, the metrics necessary to, uh, to diagnose uh, the um, um, uh, COVID. I mean, not, it's not the uh, replacement for the RT-PCR test, but you know, right now we're really being stupid about the way we open up economies because what we're doing is we're doing social distancing or we're not doing social distancing. Well, it's only a small part of the population that's going to uh, be truly uh, you know, severely impacted by the coronavirus. I hate to say it, but people like me, you know, I had a heart attack uh, earlier this year 
And uh, if I get the pandemic, I may not make it. But the vast majority of you um, are going to be fine. Be uh, but we can diagnose people. If some of you are not going to be fine. Therefore, all of you have to be careful because we don't know all of the problems we have. That we, there are a set of markers that the body has which can tell us the likelihood of us getting severely ill from the, uh, the virus. The trouble is those require sophisticated tests. Well, they're adding it to health cube. And the test will cost only, you know, uh, in India, uh, uh, one of the largest companies over there is going to start rolling it out, the new technology next week. To test each person is going to cost less than $1 for these markers. So basically what it will do is it will tell people what their risk scores are. So if their risk score is low, then if they're careless, it's fine. The risk score is high. And then they do stupid things like going to the office like my friend did, right? Then they're in real trouble. Then they have to be ultra careful. So this is the beauty of this technology and watch how it's being used in India. This is India's greatest women. At IDEA, we have evolved the social entrepreneur model embedding the health cube. We are able to reach out to rural areas, including labor migrants, and offer them a path to proactive wellness. Timely health screening and diagnostics on 32 related tests, including all pathological tests, blood sugar, hemoglobin, blood pressure, and many more issues are diagnosed before they turn into a major illness. We have created an army of village social entrepreneurs who do the health screening at a very nominal cost. We have taken Health Cube to Haryana, Uttar Pradesh, Kerala, and Andhra Pradesh, collectively spanning 20 districts and 100 locations. In all these, we have seen a palpable change, healthier people, fewer illnesses, and a general sense of well-being. So this is again a small thing. such as this and, and save the world. Because the cost of soft, starting a software company has dropped dramatically. It used to cost millions of dollars. Now it costs thousands of dollars to start a software company. Everything is on the cloud. The same technology is available all over the world. You can save the world. All of you can. Because you know, getting back to now what are the choices we must make, we must first decide the technology is going to benefit everyone equally. If only the rich have access to technology and the poor don't, then the poor are going to kill the rich. It's like, ends up like in the dark science fiction. This is why with HealthCube, I insisted that the company take it to the developing world before it bring it to the developed world. The second thing is we want to make sure that the rewards outweigh the risks. I didn't cover all the risks of technology, but every technology has a risk and you must be aware of what you're doing, that you have to make sure that the rewards outweigh the risks. You have to make sure that it makes us independent and not dependent on technology. Because every technology can be used for good and it can be used for evil. So, you know, uh, to learn about the core technologies, I suggest you read my book, Driving the Driverless Car. This Indian version is, is cheap. It's only like $5 or so. And you can probably get, you know, go to the Indian website. And I'm cheating here by telling you how to get a cheap copy of my book. You can probably get the, uh, uh, the uh, digital version of it for uh, 3 or $4. And this Indian version also has on in it what uh, Katarzyna was talking about on how to cure cancer that um, you know, my wife passed away from cancer last year. This is why I've, you know, I've been um, uh, so focused on cancer, but I put a, a grand plan in there to cure cancer. I want you to read it and perhaps you try it in Poland because I have the secrets to curing cancer in the book as well. But again, you can go to the Indian version. It's published by HarperCollins India and it's inexpensive. Read the book. It'll tell you about the core technologies and what you can do with them. All right, so now let's hand it to my friend and let's do some Q&A. Yes, thank you very much. I mean, yeah, I, I, mm, I'm really impressed by uh, what you are doing and how we are writing also about the technology. And uh, I've got, uh, I mean, perhaps at the beginning I will mon monopolize uh, this uh, Q&A session, okay? So I've got one question to you. Because you already talked about the technology and COVID, and um, I wonder if you, what do you think about this role of the technology during this uh, first month of this uh, COVID period? Because uh, I've got the impression that uh, technology has, I can say, 
failed uh, in this more important role of keeping us uh, healthy and alive. And that actually we are using the, uh, the our response is, you know, a little bit um, like from the Middle Ages. It means we are uh, proposing, I mean, the, pol the policy, the only policy is the mass uh, quarant uh, quarantines. So uh, what do you think? Why there is no uh, system of collecting uh, public health data and uh, responding uh, and the system of responding in different way, more modern? Yeah, I agree with you, by the way, and that it's medieval what we're doing here. And it's because of our politicians are incompetent, they're corrupt all over the world, and then they're mm -hmm. fighting each other. To start with, China covered everything up here. They, you know, they acted very irresponsibly and they gave us, they cursed the world with this, mm -hmm. with this virus. And then governments are blaming each other, WHO. This is why, you know, I said, look, um, there's nothing I can do about governments, but there's no reason why I can't you know, use whatever capabilities I have to try to help the world. So I started doing research and I uh, learned that there are, you know, ways of, of, of determining who's going to be at risk and then the value of antibodies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, so this is why I had the healthcare people uh, because I'm on the board of this company and, and I, you know, um, mm -hmm. I, they've been guiding them on it. I had them develop all of these new technologies and then I persuaded some big companies to test it out. So that's being tested in, in India right now. It's being tested in Mexico and maybe in the United States also. So I basically stepped into it myself and saying we have to use technology for this. And I, I basically did whatever I could to get involved and, and help out. It's what we have to do that, you know, we can't rely upon governments that they will let us down. It's up to mm -hmm. entrepreneurs now to, you know, to solve problems. Entrepreneurs can do what go only governments and big research labs could do before. So we have to do like I'm doing and, and do every bit we can to use technology to, to uh, solve big problems. But don't you think that this period is also uh, very dangerous a little bit if we allow uh, too much, if we give uh, too much power to this big tech? Yeah, it is, I'm worried about this is what my book, The Happiness Was Hacked was about. That I talked mm -hmm. about the the you know how the technology uh, industry is using uh, technology for evil. That's what mm -hmm. driver and driverless car. I said that look, we can use technology for good and we can use it for evil. And I and talked about why we have to use mm -hmm. it for good. Well, you have Mark Zuckerberg and you have you know uh, uh, companies such as uh, Facebook who are using it for evil. It's all about making money and they cut off from reality. So I've been very vocal about the the corruption of Silicon Valley and their obsession with making money versus doing good for the world, that they hijacked technology and, and did evil for it, uh, evil with it. This is why I'm speaking to, to, uh, to all of you, because I want to get you to realize mm -hmm. that you can now you know, uh, do big things. Like I gave you two or three examples of what entrepreneurs are doing and what's becoming possible. Well, there's no reason why you have to let anything stop you. Mm -hmm. I can't change Facebook. I mean, I've protested against Facebook. I mean, I've uh, written to Mark Zuckerberg and uh, Sheryl Sandberg and expressed my views. They won't listen mm -hmm. to me. So fine. So what do I do? I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on problems that I can solve and trying to do good for the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, also you're having a lot of ideas concerning the data that uh, can be used uh, for the health. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, um, the, in, in, you know, in the Indian version of driving the driverless car, I talked about how do you cure, cure cancer. To me, it's a, data, it's a data game that we don't, just like for, uh, for the pandemic, for COVID, we don't have enough data. Therefore, we don't know what is and hasn't happening. We're waiting for new research projects to come out. On cancer, the way it works is that all of these um, pharmaceutical companies, they're doing what the tech industry is doing, that they're trying to profit from, from all of this versus doing good for the world. So they keep hoarding the data. So what I suggested to uh, the Indian prime minister, I actually went and met him. What I proposed to him was that he launched the largest clinical trial in world history, 100,000 people. 100,000 mm -hmm. people get genome sequenced. Um, they you know, get um, uh, 3D printed medicines. We open source all of this. And, and we let entrepreneurs all over the world now to cure cancer with the data because it's if we had enough data on uh, you know, the correlation between um, uh, our lifestyle, our habits, and our genes and mm -hmm. different types of cancer, we would now be able to pinpoint exactly what does and doesn't work. We would be able to get data on what targeted therapies work versus what uh, other things we can do. So this is what I have proposed in a nutshell. Okay. I've got two questions. The first is concerning your book about women. So uh, this crisis will disrupt many sectors in which women currently are the majority of workers. 
what solutions, also technical, would you suggest to lessen to, uh, to the negative consequences to women workers? Yeah, we need to have women rise up now and realize that they don't need to feel inferior to men, that um, mm -hmm. women are more sensible, they're smarter than men are in many cases. I mean, or they, you know, at best they're smart as men are, but but they have uh, they're much more sensible. So therefore, I give them a li likely a higher chance of success. So women have to first of all realize that they can now change the world. That just like any mm -hmm. entrepreneur can do it, any woman entrepreneur can do it, and no woman should feel uh, left out. And then what we have to do is we have to correct the system. We have to realize the biases. I live in Silicon Valley. I've been brutal about the male you know uh, domination of Silicon Valley and how it discriminates against women. The same thing is happening in Poland. You folks are no better than this. Mm -hmm. You know, I know because I've spent enough time in Europe to know that you're a bunch of sexist jerks, just like the people over here are. And we have to get, um, you have to basically hold men accountable for, for disrespecting women and not you know, giving them the opportunities they deserve. But, but at the end of the day, this is what the book was about. The women have mm -hmm. to help each other and rise mm -hmm. above it and realize mm -hmm. that they can change the world. Yeah, and a uh, small question concerning women. Do you think that COVID and recession and the accelerated digital transformation will also get impact on the market and women? I mean, what do you think? What is going right, right to happen? Now, sadly, women are losing their jobs more mm. than men are because of yeah. this. But mm. you know, that's what always happens. It's a male-dominated world. But this will, you know, a year from now, this will just be history, and we'll be back, mm -hmm. you know, resetting society. But the good thing is that women are now, you know, in, uh, there are more women scientists uh, who are, women are learning, you know, science, there are more women studying science than ever before. So women mm -hmm. are going to take increasing roles. It's unstoppable. Women are ultimately going to uh, rule the world in innovation. Okay. The other question is, uh, what do you think are the most important technical trends? What would you invest your money in? Uh, there's so many different things at the same. It's not one, it's many technologies. And what you have to do mm -hmm. is learn the intersections of technologies. In fact, so what you, all of you should do is, do is read Drive in the Driverless Car. And again, I said, buy the cheap Indian version, if nothing else. Um, I have a new book coming out uh, later this year, uh, which is called From Incremental to Exponential. It's on the techniques for innovation, everything from building platforms to uh, ideas. Also, a lot, a lot of new concepts in innovation. That comes out in September, October, That'll, that'll be an essential rating for you on new innovation methods, uh, mm -hmm. uh, taking into account exponential technologies. It's a very long topic. That's why I wrote an entire book on it. Right. Okay. The other question is about the future of work. Can you tell us more about uh, the future that you see and uh, what will be influenced by the future you pro predict? Well, you know, I started off with my talk by saying that I don't think that the future of work is work. The future of work is no work mm. because I see the robots taking over, AI being able to do the job of humans. It's going to take longer than I say because it always does. But mm -hmm. in the uh, 15, 20 year time frame, I see, uh, you know, the, um, the vast majority of our, the human race being unemployed. We have to think about new social structures. We have to think about what we do with our time. We have to think about what this means. But we have a few years before we have to worry about that. But it is coming because I can see, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, technology is being able to take over a lot of the grunt work that human beings are doing, which means that all that's left is some intellectual work and we need fewer human beings for that uh, because mm. the smart computers will be smarter than we are by the time they're done. <laughs> so uh, the other question is about the, I mean, this future and the key competences that we need to fight uh, these challenges. You have to realize that, um, you are not at a disadvantage to anyone in the West, that anyone in, in America, that you have the same knowledge available to you, the same tools available to you, that you have to keep learning, you have to keep reinventing yourself, you have to learn exponential technologies. The single most important thing I take away you should get from this talk is that you have to learn not one technology, but many technologies, and then understand how their convergences work. Mm -hmm. And then you have to realize that you can make an impact on the world. There's nothing stopping you from building a world-changing okay. technology many things at the same time. That's beautiful. <laughs> uh, the other question, what do you think is the biggest opportunity and the, a treat that the artificial intelligence might bring in the future? You see, artificial intelligence right now is overhyped. What artificial intelligence is today is pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. That you give it a, a data, you give it a, a model, and, and you train that model, basically. So what it does, it looks at the data and, and it shifts the way it's and, and it, it does pattern recognition in a smart way. So a lot of the data analysis that we do can be done better with AI. 
eventually mm -hmm. that ai is going to you know look so smart that on many things it's going to seem human like but it, it but this concept of agi artificial general intelligence a lot of that is science fiction right now it just helps us analyze information better and make smarter mm -hmm. decisions that's how you should look at ai right now mm -hmm. Okay, the other uh, technology solutions can help, uh, can solve many problems, but also solution, uh, social solution and social innovation are important. What do you yes. think about the states? I 100% agree with that because so. um, if, you know, this is why I keep talking about solving the grand challenges of humanity. And this is why I keep saying that we have to make sure we share the technologies equitably. That's what the, the whole message of the, my, my book, Driving the Driverless Car is. Then we have to now make sure that we use technology for good and not evil. That's what I mean by the social thing. But I also don't believe in social enterprises that don't make profits. I think you have to make a lot of profit and build a sustainable ex enterprise. You, 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 you become a billionaire by helping a billion people. That's the key lesson. Mm, good. The other question about the woman, but the woman in tech and uh, how COVID influences uh, on the woman in tech. It's related um, to your book, actually. <laughs> yeah, I women mean, are, uh, are at a perpetual disadvantage right now. But mm. um, it, I mean, when we come out of it, it'll be a lot more normal. And then women really have to realize that they're equal and that they can make an impact and they can do the same thing that uh, men can do. I mean, it, it's more of the same, essentially, that women have to now realize their abilities and, and, and do all they can to change, make the world a better place. Mm. Can you comment about the extreme future for financial services? When you talk about financial services and you talk about technology, people keep coming to Bitcoin. I call Bitcoin bit toast mm -hmm. that, you know, it, it's overhyped and so on. I don't believe in, um, um, you know, speculative assets, but digital currencies are coming. There's no doubt about it. That, we, that it's all going to be digital and that we're going to have all sorts of new financial instruments. AI being applied to finance means that we can make better and faster decisions. So there are all sorts of opportunities for, for all of you to get involved, realizing the, the exponential trends. Just don't get caught up on in the hype that, you know, on any one technology, uh, mm -hmm. even blockchain. Blockchain might have some good uses, but it's being overhyped. Blockchain is not the future of finance. Blockchain is an enabler for you know, better security, better asset management but it also has a limited purpose. There are many, mm -hmm. many other things happening that you should uh, be aware of. And then again, look at the exponential trends. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question is about the, it says uh, focus more on strategy or execution, Innova innovators persistent dilemma. What do you think is more important from your perspective? You have to start with a strategy and with a, a, a vision for mm -hmm. what's possible and then you have to test it. You have to try it out. You have to now mm -hmm. execute and try one thing out and realize that most likely you're wrong. No matter what your mm -hmm. great idea was that you got probably messed up and got it wrong, you just keep trying until you get, find the right, uh, you know, you find a solution that customers really want, that people really have to have it, and then they have to be ready to pay for it. You have mm -hmm. that, now you focus on execution and, and you build up from it. Okay, the other question is about how to speed up the invention of the COVID vaccine. Um, that the good news is that there are already about a hundred companies doing it. And I don't mm -hmm. think that there's anything that all of you can do on this thing because COVID will have come and gone by the time you make any, any breakthroughs, What you should do is look at how it is being treated and now start applying those lessons to other uh, diseases because COVID is just, you know, the, 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 the one that hit us right now, there are a thousand other diseases that you can uh, solve. What you should do is learn from how the solutions are being built. Learn from how they're using RNA and DNA and data and learn mm -hmm. from the new methods of innovation that COVID is forcing us to uh, do and apply those to other things. Apply those to cancer. Apply those to you know, every other disease there is. That's where you can make your money and that's where you can make your impact. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question, what do you think about evolutionary economics and uh, that many ideas and technologies having no chance to start off? Yeah, that happens. I mean, but the fact is that mm. before uh, it was very hard for someone with a great idea to do anything with it. Now entrepreneurs everywhere can build some amazing technologies. The example I gave you was HealthCube. That technology could not have been built in the West because the system mm -hmm. is so corrupt. It's so lethargic. It's so bureaucratic that you could not have disrupted the healthcare system. So what did we do? We built this in India, took it to Africa, tested it in Africa. So now the device has done two and a half million tests already. Mm. And now it's the time to bring it to the West. So evolutionary economics, whatever you want to call it, the fact is that great ideas 
used to get uh, limited. Now you can test them out on a micro level everywhere. And then if they work there, then you start scaling them up to, uh, to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do you think? Uh, does technology bring equal uh, benefits to everyone who is losing on digital transformation and uh, what is needed to make it beneficial? No, it doesn't. Everyone. Because look, yeah, look at what's <laughs> happening with Facebook. That you know, the, the tech companies right now are doing better than ever. They have become you know even richer mm -hmm. than they were before. So it's helping mm -hmm. the rich, not the poor. It's helping the powerful, not the weak. Right. So this is the problem with technology, and this is why we need to have entrepreneurs now developing the next generation of technologies and disrupting the uh, the, the you know the big players by building some world changing things. So like again, getting back to the health cube example from India. Well, we mm -hmm. did it in the developing world. Now, if we bring it to the West, suddenly you have diagnostics at home mm. that even in Poland, you could actually buy the device and take it to Poland. Uh, you know, $1,500 is nothing for having a complete medical uh, lab in your home, right? So what you uh, do essentially is that you build it in one market where you can test it out and then you take it to the other markets where it was protected and the magic happens on its own. <laughs> yeah. And uh, can we talk a little bit about this uh, personalized education and healthcare that you are also writing in your books? Can you present briefly this idea, how it's going to happen? Yeah, you see, uh, if you look at virtual reality right now, um, okay. we are still very cumbersome. But imagine if you started building learning apps for the Polish market. Uh, you know, start with your local market uh, using VR. That you, mm -hmm. you know, because some children may have a difficulty reading books or learning the traditional way. You want to learn calculus, mm -hmm. you have them build pyramids. If you want them to uh, learn, uh, you know, Spanish, you take them to ancient Spain. Um, you want to learn mm -hmm. Latin, go, uh, where, where was Latin? Italy, uh, wherever Latin grew up in, you take them into, into that world, you mm -hmm. have them interact in new ways, right? So the, that's a new method of educating by having people do things. Virtual reality makes it possible. Again, the argument would be today, people don't have virtual reality headsets. But if you realize that three years from now, people will have mm. headsets. It's going to take you three years to get this stuff working. You might as well start building it right now. And then AI, AI tutors. Basically, you know, mm. right now you can see me, uh, you can already get AI tools that can recognize my emotion, that can transcribe what I'm saying. So you can start now apply, applying these AI technologies to education. And, and and again, start off in Poland. You know, you know, start off in Polish. It's a protected market. You don't have other people mm -hmm. doing it. And whatever you build there, you will be able to test it locally and build all sorts of amazing things with it. So you can now, you know, within five years from now, the education will be transformed in major ways because now schools are already coming online. I'm teaching at Carnegie Mellon. The entire semester I taught online. And like I'm teaching mm -hmm. to you, this is how I taught. So we move forward into the future because of uh, the pandemic. But once technology becomes faster, cheaper, and more powerful, a number of technologies become powerful, which is AI and virtual reality and sensors, suddenly mm -hmm. you'll be able to disrupt education. But you can start planning for it right now. Mm. When do you think a real and positive revolution will take place in the minds of people around the world? Will good eventually prevail and can only disaster accelerate it? Well, um, you know, every time I become <laughs> optimistic, then I see more evil happening. Uh, yeah. So uh, the answer is yes, good can prevail and it must prevail because mm -hmm. the alternative is the darkness of Bad Max, of us destroying mm -hmm. humanity, killing each other. Those are the choices we have. That, um, and this is why we need to have entrepreneurs taking the mantle here. Entrepreneurs now taking uh, you know, innovation into their own hands and disrupting industries mm -hmm. and societies. Because you know, entrepreneurs generally care more about the world than the rich people who are running these companies and the corrupt politicians do. Okay, the other questions. I mean, it's a very quick uh, Q&A session. I mean, really, I appreciate <laughs> that you're answering to all these questions. The other question, in your opinion, what is the best innovation connected with the COVID made by women in the world? Do you know? <laughs> women are involved with every aspect of it. I mean, the, you know, the problem is that they never get credit for it. You know, for example, mm. I talked about HealthCube. You know, the chief scientist of, of HealthCube is a woman. The entire yeah. team is, is now women. Uh, their CEO, Ramanan Lakshmi Narayan, told me that uh, uh, you know, he was floundering for a long time. It was mostly all men. He had almost no women. He says, he, you know, he, he, and, and I mean, the company was in big trouble for a while. He ended up replacing 
the, the majority of men with majority women. And now the company is taking off like a light ship because women are doing it. So it's the same thing with a lot of the labs uh, that are building these technologies, vaccines and so on. You have women in key roles, except you don't hear about them because the, the, you know, the, the men take all the credit. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. <laughs> okay, the last question. Uh, what do you think is the most likely to affect technology development? The military, military space, which part of the administration? No, um, the, I mean, military is using technology, but you know, the, interestingly, what happens now is that you have the CIA and the NSA going to entrepreneurs here in America uh, to give them help in, in trying to fight other governments. So that governments are now dependent on entrepreneurs. So uh, mm -hmm. we have control now. We can change the world. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. I think that we have to uh, to end because the time is passing. Yes, Bartosz, am I right? Yeah, the, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately. I, I think that uh, our attendees uh, could ask, ask, and ask all the time, and ah. uh, your your answers uh, are so great. So we would uh, talk uh, all day or all night uh, in Poland. So thank you very much, but we have a present for you, for everybody here. Claudia, are you here? We yes, like yes, you yes, yes. Claudia's uh, work. Yes, let me do this. I hope I'm going to make it because I, I had some issues with the internet. Mm -hmm, uh, but let's see. see, let's see, let's see. Mm -hmm. So just give me one second. I want to say also that I am uh, Vivek. Okay, uh, I am. I'm extremely inspired, and I, I wish. Uh, I wish more people will have this so positive and optimistic, uh, you know, way of looking. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's really pretty amazing. Yeah, which is not what is not amazing is the fact that I cannot clone my uh, I, uh, uh, iPad uh, now. Cool. Uh, technology so, oh, yeah <laughs> if i switch the internet let me let me try and now it should be working so just one more second yes all right there you go it. yeah so if uh, do, do i understand you correctly uh, is this uh, um, is this the uh because I, I saw a few um, layouts of the of the book, so we should look for the orange one, it's right? The, the Indian version, because it's cheaper, it's okay. up to date, and it has a <laughs> chapter on curing cancer in it. So, All righty. <laughs> my, US the, the other ones out. If they, my US publishers saw this video, they would freak out because uh, I'm promoting, <laughs> a, you know, a much cheaper. Yeah, will... This one costs one fifth of what the US version does. So. <laughs> All right. All right. So anyway, uh, that's uh, th th this is it, and, and thank you very much. I, I'm I'm really inspired. I'm I'm generally also a very optimistic person, but uh, it's good to <laughs> to see more of us in the world. <laughs> in optimism, right? Two of you. Optimistic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are two two of you in the world. <laughs> ah, yeah, just us. Oh, me too. Um, me too. Oh well. Okay, yeah. Three. So <laughs> Claudia, thank you very much. Katarzyna, oh. thank you for a bit moderation message. Oh. And uh, Vivek, thank you very much. And uh, uh, it was really, really great. And uh, we are very happy that uh, you were with uh, us. And of course, if you have a time, please uh, join us uh, on uh, uh, Thursday uh, with uh, presentation of uh, Itai uh, Talman from uh, Israel. You are very, very invited. Thank you very much. All right, Have thank a you. Good night, good day, and bye -bye. Uh, <laughs> we are optimistic. <laughs> bye. <laughs> Stay thank optimistic. You. Bye bye. Bye. Thank, bye. You. thank you. It was nice to meet you. <laughs> thank you.